Today we are going to be talking about amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks that make up all the unique molecules that our body produces by reading our DNA. So while you can have lots of random things like sugars and other stuff that get constructed, amino acids are used to make the proteins. These are the large biomolecules that our body uses to make up reinforcement for our cell walls, to carry molecules from one side to another. Um, They're used to speed up reactions. They're used to be signals and hormones. And like, they are used for just about everything. Amino acids are the individual components that we link together to make any large scale construction that our body makes. Well, let's talk about them a little bit then. So, what is an amino acid? So, different color here. Amino acids have a basic structure. There is an amine that goes to a carbon, and then that goes to a carbon with a carboxylic acid. Middle carbon, well, I'll put two hydrogens on for a moment. Those groups will actually change. In fact, let's get rid of it. We'll call the other one R. They have stereochemistry. That carbon with the nitrogen and the R group and the hydrogen and the other carbon, it has four different things. So it is chiral, the little chiral star from back when we were doing sugars. If you set it up this way with the amine over on the left, the carboxylic acid over on the right, you always have the R group going away from you. Now, this is the naturally occurring amino acid configuration. And you can kind of see where it gets the name. Amine and acid, it is an amino acid. Um, so amino acids are this basic building block. But what happens is that R group can change quite a lot. There are 20 naturally occurring amino acids. I'm going to shorten amino acid with AA. Now, that's true for humans and most life. But there actually are a couple other ones we found in weird organisms around deep sea vents and the like. They're usually just a very one atom swap of an existing amino acid. but. Just so you know, there are technically more amino acids. Most life is going to use 20. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how they go together. Before we show you some amino acids, we need to introduce the idea that, well, I have a carboxylic acid, and I have a nitrogen, which is good at being a base. If you have an amino acid on its own, it doesn't look like this. It really looks like that hydrogen moves over to the nitrogen so it's positively charged. The carboxylic acid has lost its H so it is negatively charged. It looks like this. Now this is still a neutral molecule but it has charges. This is a Zwitter ion. A Zwitter ion effectively is ionic while being neutral. It gives it some interesting solubility properties. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about it. And honestly, you very rarely run into free amino acids in what we're going to be discussing, so it's a point that while the book brings up, it, we won't focus on it too much. Well, let's talk about those amino acids are for a minute. The biggest change that you will see is just the R group. That little R group here is going to alter. And what is it going to be? Well, let's look at some. So in here you can see we've got our amine. Uh, like that. There's our amine, we've got our acid. And this one's flipped around a little bit, but you can see in our group, all of this. All of that is an R group. 
Sometimes our groups can be very large. Sometimes our groups can be very small. Let's see a few down below that there's not much there at all. But the idea is they can vary. And so there are, if we look here for the moment, this set of our groups here tends to be positive. Depending on what's on the molecule, sometimes your R group will be charged. It might be a cation, it might be an anion, it might be neutral, it might be polar, it might be nonpolar. How we mix those ends up leading to a lot of the properties we see in molecules, but we'll discuss that more in another part. For now, just kind of recognize how you know, some of these look. So I've got a reasonably long chain and then a bunch of NHs with a charge. That is going to be a very polar group on the end of a long chain. So it gets some distance away from the amino acid backbone and then it has a big ionic and polar bit. Where if you were to look over here at lysine, so the third one, we see a long carbon chain and then an, an ion. So again it's ionic, it's cationic and it's held long ways away from the backbone. But there's a lot more non-polar region out there. So there's a bit of size difference between them. How far do you want it to reach? How much space do you want it to fill up? Different amino acids are better for different places just because of what else is around. And so that's part of the variety we see. The right tool for the right fit. There are also anionic R groups. So you'll notice here I've got an amine, I've got a carboxylic acid again, so here's my amine on these two, I've got my default carboxylic acid on the backbone, and then, well, there's these side groups. Now, carboxylic acids are usually deprotonated in water. In fact, the backbone one really will be. Think back to the Zwitter ion, it'll give it away. But the idea is there's also this other deprotonated carboxylic acid. One is two carbons away, and one is three carbons away. So you can change how far away from the backbone you're going to have this negative charge. But if you want a negative charge, it interacts really well with water, or it interacts really well with a positive charge. And so different amino acids, again, just for different things. Now, you'll notice there's a bunch of names of amino acids. You will not be required to remember their names. Uh, a biology course in more detail definitely will do so. Um, molecular biology type materials, but for our class, we're not re requiring us to remember all 20 amino acids. Just the ideas of them and the types of our groups and being able to identify their properties, like being anionic or being cation. If we keep going down a little bit, what we can find is polar groups, but ones we don't expect to be charged. So again, you got your amine and your carboxylic acid backbone, but there are groups this time. Here's a one carbon to an OH on serine. Here's two carbons, but you still have the OH on the first one. So this one is a bit space filling, but still polar, where the other one was polar and didn't fill as much space up. You can have an amide. Remember, amides are extremely polar, but they don't really become charged easily. And so as a result, these groups are very polar and they'll stay neutrally polar throughout most of the body. Here's some special case groups. Cysteine has an SH, it gets used occasionally in the body. Too much can be dangerous, it's part of what makes onions lethal for dogs. Humans, on the other hand, can process it pretty easily, and so onions don't bother us. And if you didn't know onions are bad for dogs, they are, please don't feed your dogs onions. Um, selenocysteine, this is one of those non-natural amino acids, or at least the ones humans don't use. Uh, this one we've seen in archaea and like down around hydrothermal vents. It's just a neat discovery that there's a few other amino acids in life 
but they didn't follow our branch. Glycine, well, it has hydrogens. You'll notice that there's no R group. It just has two hydrogens. Technically, that means it's not chiral. Um, but glycine is just occasionally you don't want anything there in that part of the construction. And proline, proline's a little special. It's R group actually connects back onto its an amine. Remember your amines can be primary or secondary or even tertiary. All the other amines are primaries. But proline hooks around reconnecting to the nitrogen to make it a secondary. Um, the result of this is mostly promine, proline causes a bend in proteins. We'll talk a little bit more about when we can make proteins out of these amino acids. But proline causes a severe bend. Um, as a result, it's just good for when you want to really turn something. So it's the only one that does that. It's a little bit non-polar underneath, but it's mostly a special case for the extra shape the ring involves. And then there are non-polar amino acids. You know, you got just a methyl for your alanine. You've got an isopropyl for your valine. You've got a sort of a sick butyl for your isoleucine. There's four carbons, but you're hooked to the second one. You can have another isopropyl that's one carbon away. And so again, it's a non-polar group, but it takes up a little more space instead of the isoleucine. Methionine. Methionine has a thioether. Now, we didn't really talk about those as functional groups, but a sulfur is in the same column as oxygen. It behaves a lot like oxygen. And so this is an ether. It's a little extended. The body tends to use this one for coding and signaling. It doesn't get used in proteins all that often. Phenylalanine, if you want a big flat ring. Tyrosine, if you want a big flat nonpolar ring, but you kind of want a nonpolar end. Or sorry, a polar end. So this one's a mix. It has a very nonpolar flat ring that fits, but it's got this polar end that can then be attracted to other stuff. Same with tryptophan. It's got a very large flat ring, but it does have a little bit of a mean there. Some books, in fact, actually will move tyrosine into the polar table. Um, it's a little debatable how much LOH does or doesn't. Um, I'll take, honestly, both answers because I, I have two copies of books with me right now and they list it in different columns. But this is the idea of the amino acids. These are the different R groups coming off of them. And so the big takeaways I want to feel with this one. That is for part one, amino acid general shape, which is what we see above. There's an amine, there's a carboxylic acid, there's an R group. There are generally four types of R groups. What are those types? We've got the cationic, the anionic, the polar, and the nonpolar. And then within each category, there's just size and distance differences. But the, those are the general types of amino acids we're going to look for.